don't know. <laughs> Can you hear that? Does it work? It works? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Yes. Cheap sound effects. <laughs> We're so happy hey. to be here. Cheap. <laughs> Cheap sound effects for the next episode of the Cathode Ray Podcast. Uh, my name's Louis Desirad. Thanks for joining us. I got my friend Steve here. We're both pretty. It's one of those. Uh, we're just chatting. It's a bit low energy. I'm hungover as sin <laughs> after a big night out last night. So we're just cruising, chatting, and we thought we should turn on the uh, turn on the recorder and let you listen. How are you feeling these days, Steve? Yeah, I, I've. Uh... We were having some conversation before this, and we realized we should probably just start talking because we were yeah. we were just going and going and going. I've I've been doing okay. I feel pretty good today because yesterday, I finally decided to get in and do some uh, some personal uh, fitness and some exercise. So uh, that's something I haven't done in a very long time, other than my normal CRT lugging, lifting. <laughs> yeah. So that that made me feel better. So what better. were you doing yesterday? Yeah. So what we what yes. exercise were you doing yesterday? So if no. anybody, I mean, so I know there's going to be a, a segment of our audience that will know about our friend Mr. Diamond Dallas Page, DDP, and his infamous diamond cutter from the '90s and uh, early 2000s. But he was a famous, big time wrestler here in uh, the United States, and uh, the last decade he's come out with a workout program called DDP Yoga. And I got it as a gift a couple years ago, and because uh, my wife's like, "Oh, you need to get something that you'd like to do to exercise." I was, I hate, I hate to have all forms of exercise for the most part, organized exercise. So I said, "Yeah." I'm watching that while you're talking, I'm looking it up. Yeah, look at oh, this. Is and so I was like, "Yeah, you know what? I'll try this. This is cool. I can have DDP yell at me through the TV screen." And motivate me to to work out. So I, I did it, and I when I got it, I did it for like two months, and then you know life gets in the way, and and of course you let it, and I just slacked off and stopped doing it, and I was feeling kind of crummy from just working myself too much, not sleeping much. And yesterday I was like, I'm just gonna pop in the old DDP DVD, say that <laughs> quick, and yeah. do a quick. 45 minute workout and i did and it felt felt really really good so i'll probably do another one after we get done here okay it's good yeah. man it's good yeah it's not no what is what's the, i love this tagline here not your mama's yoga <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah he tries to like wrestleify or like put the wrestling slang into all the the silly moves you know like the the he's calling them different moves like because i would do these moves and my wife was like come to yoga with me and i did once or twice so this was back when i was doing it a lot uh, and i was like she the, the person would say a move and start doing it and i was like i don't know that move by what they're calling it that's called like the diamond crusher and then I, i'm like <laughs> really it's really just called like a downward dog and like oh no man this is called your like <laughs> your it's good if it yeah, motivates your you. core it destroyer you it you... and it's like so it's like yeah, oh destroyer. yeah it's, a, it's just it's it's a little cheesy, but uh, I think I just I mean really it, it was the best I'd ever done with it. I just needed to keep going with it. So we'll see. Maybe maybe I could be on a testimonial one day. It's good, man. I gotta get out. I was I've been cycling a lot lately, and uh, I had a flat tire. I had to walk home with my flat tire. Replace the flat tire on my bike. Thought I'll use the old tube. It's fine. I'll just recycle the old tube. <laughs> Turns out it was also good. I got to town. Had another flat. I had to take the train home. So today, for the second time after we're done here, I'm going to have to go and fix the back tire on my bike uh, and, and so I can start cycling again. But that's that's what's keeping me going right now is the cycling because we have such good weather here. I'm about 15 kilometers from town. So if I if I want to do something, I make myself cycle to town wow. to, to get that exercise. Yeah, it's going all right. That's good. That fits good. Well, you got to take it while you can yeah. around here. Otherwise, it's going to be... Fuck any second now. <laughs> this is literally so. So for our maybe someone's uh, knows what's going on here in the Nordics today is the Midsummer Festival. Uh, it's the big. Uh, it's it's almost I would say sometimes more important than Christmas. Uh, in that, like it's real like a kind of a Nordic thing. Everyone goes out all night, stays up. You've got that. Uh, the sun does dip where we live here. The sun does dip under the horizon, but it's kind of the longest day of the year. Just for like an hour or something, it'll dip below the horizon line. Long days. We drink, jump over the bonfire, you know, eat grill. Um, so we'll be doing that later on. And I already hit it hard yesterday. 
Uh, we were saying that uh, I went to see Jordan Peterson yesterday. So he was in Tallinn. He's got his speaking tour of the fucking world everywhere with electricity these days he's going to. And I uh, saw him in a big hole. And it was all right. You know, it's fine. We watched his lecture for 90 minutes and, you know, he's got some good points and does his thing. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with everything he says, mm-hmm. but okay, I'm, you know, willing to go listen and, and take in what he says and think about it. So it's kind of cool anytime someone comes in. Probably also the biggest thing was that I got free tickets because I know the promoter. <laughs> so that inspires me to to get along there. So we were drinking before, drinking after. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, it's low, <laughs> it's low energy, Lewis, today. It's not like last podcast thumbnail. <laughs> yeah, Lewis. yeah, that's... Uh last week yeah we had some energy this week yeah i was kind of like I mean, it's fine i'm not feeling i'm just i'm not feeling bad myself either but i am feeling like a little bit relaxed and and chilled out Ooh, which is good. is good yeah that's good okay. it's good to take a step back but mm-hmm. what uh so you still got a heavy you got a heavy workload of of uh of repairs still going on i've got yeah i mean i've got stuff here uh i've tried to keep pressing on as i go i did uh, I did get some, a, a lot of work done that was, that's been picked up stuff scheduled to be picked up. And then I was able to actually get some of my own things done too, that, um, some of them have already been sold off to Patreon members. Uh, so I was able to get actually through, I couldn't believe it. I got through three different 13 inch while I was, you know, spreading out my work weeks of the last couple of weeks, I was able to get three of my own 13 inch PVMs redone and two of them have sold. So those ones, you've, you, yeah, you've showed me that. So you are mostly just sort of using your personal contacts on the Patreon and saying, Hey guys, I've got this monitor. I fixed it up, restored it. It looks great. You know, who wants You're kind of giving your Patreon members first pick of the, the monitors you've, you've restored. Yeah. That's where I take them first. And it's sporadic i don't tend to have a lot of them available so i go there and anymore they sell pretty quickly on there um Mm. so like this last one was gone within probably 12 hours uh when i listed it somebody's like yeah i'll come get it and so it's yeah it's like it's just something that i it's i also have other people that reach out to me and they tell me they're looking for one and then over a process of a couple of months, I can generally find one, fix it, and fully redo it, and do whatever they want to it, and then offer it. That takes a little bit longer, but at least you're getting something. So most of the time, they, people at least get what they want and know it's coming from a good place and that it's been fully taken care of. Um, For me, that's the big yeah. thing that it, it's coming from you. That you know, we're we're tell we're me and you, left, right, and center. We're telling people we're dreaming. <laughs> yeah. We're telling them they got no idea. But we, I think, my point with all of that is these are people who don't know what they've got, don't know what they're doing, just flogging off the next thing that they've they've picked up and trying to flip it. And you know what you've got is something you've picked it up, you've looked over it, you've 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 put your eye on the whole thing, restored it all. This is, I mean, it's as good as to me. If if I was looking to, if I was going to drop a reasonable amount of money on a, a PVM. I would then think I want to drop a bit more to like, am I going to spend X amount to just get one or am I going to spend X amount plus a bit more to ensure that I got one recap service come from a good place? Um, I think it's worth it. It's, it's, it's good, man. Yeah, there's there's a lot of people that I know feel that way too. It's But it, uh, the good thing to me too, though, is I get to then cut out the hassle of working with eBay and I get yeah. to work one on one with people. I try to arrange them to come and get things, or I've actually been using the U this U ship program here in the United States more. And if Ooh. you can get it, it's it's generally speaking, I've got one that I've got to send out west here soon, and I got some quotes from. Of course, it's a thirteen inch PVM, and I've got some quotes okay. from the shipper or what the U ship thinks it would cost. And it's like around $200. And the good thing is though, is this is like a personal shipper is going to come to me, pick this up and take it in hand, deliver it. It's not going to go anywhere else, right? It's just going to sit on that truck and be strapped in or the trailer. And so what I'm going to do this time is um, I've got extra blankets left over from like moving blankets. And they only like $7 mm-hmm. a piece for a moving blanket here. So I'm just going to wrap this PVM in the moving blanket 
and send it that way. I may put the moving blanket in a box, but I'm not sure. I'm not even sure that the, that's necessary because then they'll just take that moving blanket and just set it in a spot and then drive it over to this other person's house. And if you combine that with the guarantee, basically, that it's not going to be broken or damaged at all. Mm. Um, the only way anything gets broken with them is if they get in an auto accident, pretty much, or they get robbed, <laughs> which is like you know one or two percent. So it does happen. Imagine that the the CRT bandits turn <laughs> up. Someone's they've done their research. They know Steve's moving a D twenty four out today. <laughs> All right, we got the intel. They wait for the truck to leave the driveway. The guys pull out. There's guns. There's machine commandos, and they're taking that D24 it's, away for. They've they got a guy. They got a Saudi prince or something who's trying to get one. It's like, <laughs> it's like the tenant scene on the highway. Where they got like five trucks. Yeah, yeah. Cut this poor driver off. <laughs> yeah. Excellent reference, yeah. by the way, Steve. That. Tenant was filmed in Thailand. Yeah, I know that. My well, town uh, here actually, right now. Oh, that's how you. That's why I said it, right? it. That road. That's the hey. road. Yeah. Well, there you go. So that's I drive down that. It's a funny, funny, short, time. random story about that movie. I was on when I came back from my brother's wedding in April. Uh, I had to fly from California to Nashville, and it was a one one spot flight. Like there was no no. Um, there was a stop, but I didn't even get to get off the plane. Like it was a stop pick up. Do that one, yeah. So it was all one plane. And the whole travel was about seven hours. And on the plane, you get to watch these free movies they give you on your phone. So I watched all these movies and I got and I was like, ah, oh, tenant, I might watch that. And I'm sitting there on this plane. And after a full weekend of like partying, you know, with everybody. And I'm like, I'm gonna watch Tenet. And it gives me this warning that this is like this maybe uh, isn't the greatest thing to watch on a plane just to like give me this heads up <laughs> warning i tell you lewis i watched that movie on the plane and man my stomach turned into one giant knot because it was just so much <laughs> you know fast moving action and then the plane ride it was just like elevation change i was like i got off it and three hours later i was puking my guts out like <laughs> <laughs> I should not watch that movie today. It's <laughs> yeah, not a day no. to watch Tenet. Oh, me. my gosh. I was like, that was a great movie. Tomorrow. I couldn't stop watching it either. I was like, this is like self-punishment. Because <laughs> <laughs> so I'd never seen it. I was like, I'm going to watch it now because I remember finding out that it was filmed here and you, uh, where you live in. So. Yeah, a bunch of my friends uh, on on Saturday, uh, last Saturday night, uh, I forget what I was talking about this, we had a, a huge event for our, our comedy production company here in Estonia, we did two nights at the biggest hall uh, in the country, in the biggest theater, sorry, not quite hall, but like biggest proper seated theater in the country called the Lexella Hall. And uh, we did two nights there with our main star. And we filmed it as well. I can't remember if it was five or seven cameras, how many thousands we spent to, to film because both nights get filmed uh, so they can edit it down. And yeah, our director, she's worked with us a lot. And she was uh, one of the assistant directors on Tenant as well. So there's our connection. Well, half of the Estonia movie industry could say that. So yeah, it's a good, it's a good thing for like everybody then to get that on their resumes, right? Their IMDb's page. Yep. So that's what we need uh, a small yeah. movie like this. So and uh, and apparently what what's happened uh, even after Tent talking to friends who are in the movie industry here is um, that sort of events like that have now meant that we've got our all our world class like our I don't know directors of photography and sound guys and light guys and film guys they're all working overseas now so it's really hard to find good talent in Estonia because they all got poached because they do such a good job so good thing for the industry I guess. So yeah. Anyway, we've got our we got our director. She filmed everything the other night. Uh, I'm looking forward to, awesome. to seeing that footage. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be cool. Yeah, that's cool. So we're doing that. So so yeah, we're doing that. And uh, so for me this week, I was yeah, I finally put out my lag tester video. Yeah, um, I'm a bit slower than you to to pump out videos, but when I do. <laughs> Uh, so I got that one out. It took me a while. So it's the, if you haven't watched it yet, first of all, go back and watch my channel. I've got my video explaining how to create the lag uh, controller lag tester device. Uh, it's that, um, there's that big spreadsheet from Mr. Add-ons that he's got all the, the times. And this is the little device that he kind of, uh, helped create. It was already sort of in one version and he made some new versions of it. And, uh, yeah, you've got to solder onto a controller. You've got to attach wires into the controller that's the really hard bit and basically this arduino you've got a little arduino unit and it's sending off a pulse down one pin which fires a, the controller 
and then there's a return wire coming from a mister and that's receiving the round trip signal and going so basically we were using a custom mister core and that mister core fires off a special signal down an io port returns that signal back to the arduino the arduino then just does a round trip time and says your controller has x number of milliseconds of lag so yeah finally got that one out good to do it it was so yeah i usually don't do them so technical and so like steps this step that step this step that step and trying to find that balance between like some videos are like really precise i could have even been more precise like programming the arduino loading the id i sort of just flick through that and kind of presume that someone's loaded a, a file into an arduino before so even that i didn't quite go as slow as i could I had to find that balance of how fast do you go through something? How much do you show everything in detail versus, all right, we want a video that's not three hours long as well. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah it's, that was, uh, it was a cool experiment. And like the way, um, I think you did a good job of, you know, prefacing at the beginning, kind of what, what the point of it is and why you'd be interested and concerned about it. So it is a, a something that, is quite technical that you know you have to have obviously soldering stuff and know how to do it but is there so is the database that's there from mr add-ons does that have already then logged specific controllers like being for example is when the stuff you take your information that um i know you said you know you're putting it in your own spreadsheet but has he been testing a bunch of controllers and like putting the data from them there or yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he's done loads of controller tests himself. Uh, I know there was, I don't think anymore, but I know there was a time where he was accepting, like you could send him a controller and he would lag test it for you. Uh, I spoke to Mr. Addons briefly about this and he said that he, he, is somewhat interested in people uh, creating their own lag. Like, like if someone uses this adapter to create their own lag test results. Um, he's kind of interested in, in getting that data, but of course we've got to verify, like, cause then you've also got to work out, well, have you done it properly? Have you set it up properly? If he's going to accept user submissions, which oh, he said, right. like, maybe, um, that's first of all, more work for him. Cause you know, he's a very, he's not, he's a very busy guy. Um, so I understand his concern with that. And then he also has to kind of verify, have you created the device directly? You know, are you getting the consistent results and so forth? So yeah, he said he created that whole database, and he he's a uh, I mean a very clever guy knows much more about statistics than me because that database has all sorts of statistics that I don't know about the mathematics of it. I know average. I worked out what standard deviation is. Uh, you know a few things, the mean, the max, but beyond that, I don't remember anything <laughs> from my statistic classes. <laughs> so uh, uh. yeah, he told me. He told me that he's kept all of, like for that whole database that he's got, he's kept all the original CSV results. So he also has that kept that could possibly be, you know, I guess maybe later someone creates some automatic parsing machine for this and he can just stick a file in and it'll get put into the database or something. So so, um, so he's probably yeah, he's gone through and tested a lot of like the major, um, more yeah. common controllers. So I think the coolest thing about all this is, like you understand that first off, there is there's the opportunity there on your controller to add lag, right? As a, as like a big picture scene here, you got that, and then you narrow that down a little bit, and you see that um, thankfully there's already kind of a verified set of at least some information, so you can reference that list if you're if you're concerned. You know, it might be something you want to think about, right? If you're I mean, it yeah. definitely should be thought about if you're going to be playing and buying a controller is maybe looking at the lag test results on it. And then you're showing how to make the device that did that kind of testing. And then if you find that a controller is not on that list and you're like one of us super nerds and you want to get into it and do the test, you can mm -hmm. follow the information from the guides and your video to go that deep and start your own testing on controllers that are not in the list that you maybe own or that you're curious about um mm. so that's like there's two scenarios that popped up for me that were that wh why would someone want to do this right beyond just straight up beyond i'm a nerd and i want to like find out how much what's my controller what's going on because there's certainly that 
level of people that just need to know. I think in two cases. What The first case is the one that I found out that uh, I, I didn't think of this before I started the test, that my Bluetooth connection isn't very good. And I got very consistent results when I used a wired connection with my stick, when I used some the built-in dongle. But then I went to the Bluetooth connection on my 8-bit dose stick and I got really bad results. And that was able to tell me something's up. And it sounds like uh, maybe I, I haven't set up Bluetooth on my Mr. properly. I haven't looked into whether there are some settings I've missed. Also, my adapter. I wonder about this a lot because I think you're... I think it's a bit understated right now the importance of a good Bluetooth adapter if it's not built into your system already. Uh, I've got some. I've got some of the really cheap AliExpress ones, and they're trash. They shouldn't be used. I, I knew that already, and I bought a better one, still from AliExpress, but one of like the better brands that they have. U Green is one of the better brands, and I thought it was okay, but apparently not. So that was the first discovery. You know, Bluetooth is always going to have some weird issues, right? There's always, it's always a, an area to look out of a concern. How is that wireless link going? The other thing that I think could be interesting to people is I think the fight stick community, it could be very interesting for because we, there's a lot, what's going on in the fight stick community, there's a lot of this uh, internal replacing. The board, the, the PCB in your fight stick is very often replaced because you don't want to, uh, maybe your fight stick is PS4. So you put a different PCB and wire it up inside and now it can connect to, I don't know, some PC or now it can connect to some other system. And there's a lot of these universal Brooks, universal boards, these are big things. Um, and they advertise, this is a low lag. This is a, this board has one millisecond of lag. Well, these are important things to the fighting game community um, and also the shmup community. So if you replace the board, uh, you can easily work out whether it's doing what it says it's doing. Um, it's not like, you know, because most of us are just using a DualShock, a regular controller. One, you know, like you say, it's already in the database. So we don't have to, you know, it's probably there. I just want to look at the results. So that, um, I thought that was the, that's the good, yeah. If I'm looking, very good, yeah. Because yeah, I was replacing a, a arcade. Stick. I can add to that, yeah. Our friend, um, well, not just Bob, but also Arturo, a buddy of mine who's in the fight game community, has been constantly trying to get people to understand uh, the the scenarios where you have a big chain, um, like you say at the beginning of your video, where you're going from your controller to the image on the screen, basically. And that's each po portion of that is going to add what seems to be an insignificant amount of latency. And however, when you combine all those things together, like the display latency, the console latency, and then if you have any controller latency, if you're combining that together, is it somehow pushing that total latency number where it starts to move into like closer to a frame or something that some people may be noticing or at least think they notice, right? So you like yeah, stacking, well, are they noticing right? One of them? So you're stacking milliseconds there. And that's it. That is important sure. because if you take a stick that you test and it comes up one or two milliseconds of latency, right? And then you have another stick board that was getting six milliseconds or something. I don't know. I mean, these are just numbers. Sure. And from a level of just like somebody saying, well, you're not noticing that latency. It may be true, but when you're stacking that through the whole chain of latency, if you have a mm. refresh rate on your monitor that adds a slightly, you know, more latency, then you start to get where the latency does become um, a portion and mathematically. So that's very important. Yeah, there's another thing. Well, yeah, and also with the fight sticks, not just the, the people do the PCB swap and, and and insert different PCBs, but what's also common are these Brook adapters. Mm -hmm. So if you've got, I don't know, your Xbox One fight stick and you're like, oh, now I want to play on my uh, PlayStation 4. Well, it doesn't work, right? It's an Xbox controller. It doesn't just work on that. So a few companies, but particularly Brook, have these adapters, which basically a USB dongle you st and... And they've got all sorts of versions and there'll be a version that like takes Xbox stick and converts to PS4. And these are in kind of a cool thing. Uh, I think they're a neat thing. I don't, they're not quite cheap enough for my liking, but nevertheless. And, but I'm a bit concerned about lag and I don't think, 
uh, sometimes it's a little bit unclear what's the lag. I'm not sure these are recorded somewhere. So I've never used one because I didn't. I was sort of about 50 bucks for iffy lag. Could be, could be not. So this could be very easily tested in this scenario. So you could also not just be looking to test your PCB, but I could also be testing different adapters um, as well. But what you're talking about stacking milliseconds and adding all up, there's, there's a bit... Uh, look, I'm not going to pretend I completely understand this whole thing, but it, it, it's tricky to understand. But consider we've got a frame that's 16 milliseconds. And it's because it, it's something like well, you might say like, well, if I've got five from a stick and five from a TV, is that uh, is that 10 milliseconds? Yes, at a broad level. But the, the bit that kind of, it blows my mind and I, I try, try to like, because then it's sort of like, Sometimes that means that the closer you get to 16 milliseconds, the closer it means your input signal might be processed in the next frame. Because remember, a frame is sort of like, there's still processing going on in the background as well. I know I'm not <laughs> explaining this very well because it, it, it blows. It's like a bad episode of Star Trek where there's time travel and you can't make yeah, out no, the plot. You're trying to go too going deep back here. Around. You're trying to explain trying to the, deep. the time some, machine now. Yeah. That there's... So, there's if it's too close to it, might the, the the that might get pushed over. Even though it, it could get the process. It, well, either way, it's causing it, it could 10, cause a disruption, it, oh. right? Let's just call it yeah. a disruption in the force. Okay, let's not let's when not go right. Let's not go into yeah. the, the depth of what that is actually. Without I don't know. So, but maybe someone yeah, somebody smart. We can have somebody that. come on and talk more about this. That's in the that mm. community. The when does it? But get yeah. Processed? So, but but then um, but then you're actually you could go back to your other point where the Bluetooth in your scenario was adding uh, things that you that were not recorded because it was something specific to your setup. Well, then um, using this test could identify that in your setup. Maybe you're like, why the heck do I feel like my setup? has more lag than it should be because I bought this controller. I bought this monitor. That's really low latency. Mm. I'm playing my fight sticks games, but I'm still feeling like something's off. And then like you say, you do this test, you realize, Holy crap, it's this dongle or maybe you live in an area or your setups set up in a way that it's getting some kind of weird interference from something else that's causing the Bluetooth mm to spike at times and cause you to have input latency. And hmm. I don't see, I mean, that sounds completely logical to me. So because what my statistics, what I saw on the Bluetooth one, the, the standard deviation number was much larger. So it's not just that, oh, the, the database says seven milliseconds and I got an average of 14 milliseconds. What the stand, what the, the, the higher standard deviation number means is that my results were like much wilder, were much more because it's just an average, right? 14 or, or, or seven milliseconds. That's just the average. You could have one millisecond. You could have 27 milliseconds. That's the, and that, the range on there. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, standard deviation is telling you about the right. range. And so by that, and it's so sure, yes, I got 14 seconds rather than seven, but the, 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 the large standard deviation number tells me that I'm getting really large results as well, which is what that's telling me is it's not just my stick being good and it just happens to get 14 milliseconds. That tells me there's something real funny. Some of these are clocking in at 20, 30 uh, milliseconds like really large and some are one and two so it's getting average down to 14 and does this go back if to the, the quality the... of this dongle most of the time and then i guess yeah a, a high standard deviation shouldn't really be there i think that's the even if it was just a 14 millisecond sticker telling me the sticks giving you really inconsistent numbers mm -hmm. i guess we could say with high so inconsistent numbers mean sometimes you're feeling good and in the next moment it's like what this isn't it's very it's very variable yeah so we, we talk about this with screen lag a lot that lag uh, in itself doesn't necessarily have to be bad if you've got like just a bit right if it's consistent if it's always consistently the same one frame, frame and a half, 16 milliseconds, then the brain can adjust. That can work. The real tricky thing about lag is when it's inconsistent. It's one millisecond, then it's 30 milliseconds, then it's one frame, then it's two frames in the next one. The brain can't adjust. 
So a high standard deviation, that's a real red, red, uh, red flag saying this is not looking good. You're going to get a lot of wild results. Wow. Yeah. It makes a lot more sense. That's great. Well, that's a cool aspect. Yeah, that's cool. So I got, after we did that, I started to think more now. Now I'm going back to the, the monitor testing stuff. And maybe someone who's listening to this have an input. So I've got my next idea, Steve. I don't think I told you about this next idea. Uh, I've got two new ideas. I've been looking in and I can't see so far that anyone has used a time sleuth to lag test a projector. Have you heard of that? How, how are you going to do that? How would it work? Yeah. Okay. I thought of something. <laughs> So <laughs> the hell are you we would have to we would have to hold the time sleuth up to the lens. So it's still beaming in the picture, but you, you're right there. Yeah. Can the time sleuth but handle that that high uh -huh. of a lumen? Well maybe there's a distance, <laughs> right? Maybe there's a proper distance no, I mean, from the projector. I've never heard of it. it. I don't know. Do you have a projector? Out. And of course, Okay, so my next idea is, uh, I don't know whether this works or not, uh, whether this will even work, how it goes, how, like, do you have to hold it up to the projector or further back? Um, I don't really know that much about styles of projectors. projectors. There's the LCD and the DLP, and God knows then there's your beautiful CRT Well, I was going to say, on my CRT kinds. projector, you could easily test it because you could pull the lens thing off. And it's just three mm. individual tubes, so you could test. Shop, but so could but again, that's like a tube that's blowing at a hundred lumens, and that's nothing. Like I was laughing with the guy who sent it home with me. Mm. It's nothing so compared low. to the like ten thousand lumens that'll burn your eyes at uh, at at the museum they had, like these crazy ones. Uh, so the modern, because uh, that's what a lot of those places are doing are using some insane modern. Uh, screen projectors mm. on their white walls because they've got all these white walls. Right, so because they have to have like it's like daylight almost. They've got to show. Them yeah, and it's the, just it's yeah. it works for that. And then so I know that like you know you it wouldn't make sense that you could put you'd ha you'd have to do it somewhere in the lens. But yeah, I don't know. That's interesting. So I was hoping that, but then also I, I realized this morning thinking about this plan that if you've got the time sleuth and you're holding it up to the projector, you know, like full on like that right well then you can't see the results on you know what i mean like usually you oh, hold the yeah you're right because it up to a screen tells you on the screen you're never seeing the results so uh, uh, you would have to hdmi split yeah, yeah the yeah. time sleuth <laughs> going off to a monitor that you just read for results and then the other one is going into the projector so my idea for the next video is I want to go see my mate who runs the Commissioni Kalp secondhand electronics store. I know he's got projectors mm -hmm. sitting there for sale. And he's told me before, if I want to borrow anything, just come down. And uh, so I go, my idea for the video is I start out the front. And I'm like, hey, we're going to go grab some projectors. Uh, I go into the store. I select like three or four of them. Take three or four different, whatever, like whatever he's got. And then take them home and see if this works. And then maybe there's an LCD one and maybe there's an older one and maybe there's a newer one and see if I can get some results based off that. And all, all these are HDMI input ones, you think? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm sure he probably has a bunch of different ones. Maybe he's got a bunch of ones, right? Well, I mean, so you, I think could, the, but the you could more... do that and you could even, even if it doesn't work, it would be fun to see it tested and then yeah. even uh, testing all this stuff out and then you could show even how the mister works on them, you know? Yeah. Really? So there's something there. Like I, if I get this pile of projectors for a day, then I could do a bit more your style video. Like it wouldn't be scripted word <laughs> yeah, for word. Yeah, you don't have to. It'd be me just talking through it. And I want to do one of those because I could do it end to end in one day, bring four projectors back here, shine them. If the, I want the time sleuth to work, if I got my crazy way for it. Because, so Steve, second idea, right? Um, I want the reason I want to learn how to lag test a projector is because in September my friends are running that big video games night here in Thailand again mm -hmm. that happens in the movie cinema, 
And I know they spend all afternoon setting those things up. So there would be an opportunity for me if I went in the afternoon to lag test the cinema projector. <laughs> and if I can learn how to stick it in front of the screen, I could lag test the cinema projector, mm. which I think, first of all, loads of people would be interested to hear about. Like what they would just, I think that would be a like a whole video on its own, me trying to <laughs> lag test the cinema projector. Because I know that when um, this games night has their thing, everyone's complaining about the lag on the projector and the guys Dude. are like, but the FIFA and, and they, what, course, what we say to them is like, there's, there's gotta be, they don't care about lag in lag. that environment. I'm sure that's the last thing. And the players complain about it. And the thing they're told is like, well, both of you are playing on the same laggy screen. So yeah. it's an even <laughs> laggy feel. Exactly. So those guys will want to know those numbers in the hall. And I think the people watching at home would be interested in that. So I've, I've, co I've concocted this. This uh, See, this is what happens when I sit back and smoke a doobie, so, Steve. So All these you're, you're ideas. The summer, who knows what you'll, who come, knows to what you'll come to after tonight's summer festival. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's the goal in September. Can I lag test? I will have Ooh, access to a cinema screen. Man. Can I lag test it? How, what kind of you know is this going to work or not i'm keen to i think because then i'm going to what i'm going to have to do is take my hdmi splitter and my second screen into the cinema hall ha i imagine this theater projector guy he's going to look at me like i'm an idiot i'm coming here with a little screen and a thing and i'm holding this thing up in front of the screen so yeah i was going to say yeah, i don't know sorry. if i'll let you get go near it me. it might be a hazard <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it a go. Otherwise, I mean, I know they rent the screen. They rent them. They used to rent the screens yeah. out, you know, in COVID times. I'm like, I'm sure it's just I like mean, a plug in, in the wall. The thing is, is you could probably have. It could be getting lagged from like. Whatever their plug in that's sending the signal to the mm. projector. Right. I mean, even that that chain of events oh what a device yeah. is in their chain yeah so, there's a lot I mean, it's of, a like, long way to go oh yeah yeah because then they would have to probably because they can't keep it well i don't even know what i wouldn't even know what signals they're using right now if they so i know that they're i i think well they're playing consoles on this cinema screen so, so there must got, be a like, hdmi yeah, like if you go somewhere. to a ballroom and do a presentation there's a breakout somewhere where it's got like <laughs> inputs and then it puts it on the screen off of a, like a projector like in a ballroom mm. for a presentation i'm sure it's something there's something like that now that's not what the movies that are being projected from the back like the good movies that are normal that's not what they're doing yeah that's what i'm wondering is if it's the possibility too is that whatever's taking that hdmi signal and sending it back there to the projector itself could be a laggy device that you wouldn't even see so i can do i mean this is fun because, uh, I mean, I know the guys who run this event. So, and I know most of the tech guys in Thailand as well. So they'll let me yeah. get it. Like if there is something else in the chain, they've got some splitters along the way. You'll be able to if see I it. have that little portable, <laughs> I just need a little portable HDMI screen you know, that I can use as my readout. I don't have I don't something know. like is that. Is there a way to make one of those cool little, like, it'd be nice to do a cool little, um, one of those little OLED screens that they have, you know, like yeah, for the... Yeah. For the uh, GBS control that people add on theirs, mm. that would be awesome to have one of those tiny OLEDs to throw on the Time Sleuth that gave you all the results on that screen and told you everything oh, yeah. that you were putting your, you know, that what mode it was so that you could have it there as well as on the screen. That would be cool. So that whole night, I can just run around testing whatever gear they've yeah. got in this setup and just like plug it in. Oh, how's this device? Yeah, excuse me for a moment. <laughs> and, <plug that. laughs> and oh, 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 speak because you, you gave me a, another idea here, Steve. Idea number three, <laughs> video number three in this three-part series of lag testing projectors, which is coming. Because uh, you, you spoke about rear projectors, which I hadn't thought of. I mean, a projector can be a front or a rear. It's like not... A projector isn't necessarily specifically a rear projector. It just flips the image, right? And then it's a rear projector. But um, in September, we are also, when we present John Cleese at the big hall in Tallinn, he will have a rear projector. And I'm pretty sure for that, because that's like a fucking huge thing, right? And um, the, the stage is very deep. So we use a rear projector uh, on that thing. And that would be like some hardcore barco 
like full on industrial style projector that we would rent for the day to ensure that that looks good. So if I can get this projector lag testing thing down, I can talk to the get my guys to just. I can also lag test a <laughs> high end Barco projector at the same time. <laughs> Sounds like fun. Yeah, just there you go. Silly to do. You can get uh... the trilogy. The trilogy yeah. will be coming. The trilogy of projector lag tests. Oh, that'll be fun. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh I've I was laughing. I, I haven't I haven't really had time to use my lag tester and uh or a a good reason to yet on anything here that I have because it's just CRTs for the most part right now. I have but I open my closet. I've got a stack of LCDs here <laughs> that I've been picking up that are nicer. And hopefully uh, some of those will have some You're interesting... saving them away when you see them at the thrift store? Well, there's certain been... ones, yeah. I got the I got the Dell ones that... A set of them, the widescreen and then like mm. the 4 by 3 version of it so that I had nice, each nice. one of those. And then I got another one that's hooked up in my shop right now that to an older XP PC that's a NEC, like multi-sync LCD panel that's really nice. I got it from Goodwill too. Like five bucks each. So... Yeah. Um, I don't. I always go look at them now, but a lot of them are just junk. It's super nasty. They get like this super nasty grunge on them. Yeah, a lot of those them. early LCDs. Oh man, people are... like, I don't know, used them as like, <laughs> they literally looked like they've been shoved up like a hippo's ass, <laughs> like pulled out <laughs> and shit on, set on a shelf. Like, what kind of grimy grease uh-huh. is on this thing? So, um, yeah, there's a lot of that. I think the. Actually, I was thinking about yeah getting these old LCDs because I've got now this 20-inch Dell 4x3, and it's really nice. It's an IPS screen. Uh, it's a little, it's a little bit dim, I think, but I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe not. I'm not. Maybe I'm just used to setting my monitors too bright or something. Um, and it's a great monitor, and it, and I've worked out this 20-inch is the largest 4x3 the Dell made. Uh, and it's almost the largest 4 by 3 made. There's a few other companies. I know there's a 21, maybe NEC or something has got like a 21-inch. Um, e- this other brand, Ezio, have these much larger ones, maybe 25-inch or something. And they make one-by-one screens. Hmm. Like they're perfect Squares. square. Because they're meant for like, I think they're more meant for professional use or, or retails or something like that. Um, but yeah, I see... And I wanted to make a video about this 20-inch screen. I kind of like it. It's it's interesting. It's uh it's got composite and S video as well. And I haven't tested it yet, but it's got picture in picture. Yeah. So I could okay. That's just kind of interesting. Why is it there? Yeah, early picture in picture stuff is interesting. The the like especially to uh the last couple CRTs that are really big that I've been working on have had interesting picture in picture stuff that I really hadn't seen on CRTs. Those. Oh yeah. Like, wow. so for example, the, um, the 40 inch Mitsubishi, yeah, that yeah, one yeah. had a crazy, you could pull up this menu in it and it would show you, uh, like I would have the, uh, S the, the 240p test suite pulled up on S video. I'd pull up this certain menu and it would show the 240p test suite screen up in a small picture in picture, you know, and then it'd <laughs> give me a different color backdrop menu and, you can set those sets to do picture in picture with that one input and then the RF so that you could input, uh, it used to be a, uh, broadcast signal, but nowadays you'd be tough to use that because you're going to be tied to using RF on those. Oh, okay. So you have to use RF and then you can use another one of the other inputs and generally you can swap those. But one of the inputs is going to be it's going to be tethered to the RF input, and uh, but yeah, they both have them. The XBR had a crazy one. I've I've been uh, God bless the cool. stupid XBRs. My goodness, those are the worst circulation air. Anybody who gets a Sony XBR, take this warning. Explain the X. Is that the one? Explain the XBR a little so bit. So the, the XBR, XBR is XBR. they've got the built-in really speakers. high end monitor or not monitor i'm sorry crt consumer set that sony made uh, a lot of them came from the 90s they have these huge dark uh tubes on them that are um a really cool looking sleek design especially the one i've seen here it doesn't have 
Sony put all the button panel like up at the top. So it doesn't really yeah. look like a normal, you know, it, it looks more like a professional where there's nothing. You don't see any button mm -hmm. panel at the bottom. It just has a Sony logo. It's got these real sleek s speakers built into it and this oh, yeah, crazy yeah, yeah, yeah. sound system in it. And so I, anyway, it was brought to me from a guy on Patreon to get worked on. And it was his growing up in the nineties, like his family owned it. And again, this is mid nineties model. And it was, you could tell it had a bunch of dust on it. Right. And I opened the son of a gun up and posted, I'll have a video coming on it, but I posted some pictures to Twitter. It was ridiculous. It was the dirtiest, dustiest crt i've ever seen and like this was not somebody who smoked thank god or it would have been uncleanable probably or you have to use some chemicals but it mm. just the way that the sea it has all these like intake and uh, heat vents but there's no fan or exhaust and it all just populates in the center where the circuit boards are and just stacks on top of all the circuit boards it's like it has these I told you it has this sound system in it. The speakers in it have like many cabinets inside of them. So the speakers have these weird odd shaped tunnels to help the sound. Uh, they're not just like a speaker in there on the chassis. There's actually these long specially designed tubes that they're, they're set in to give them bass and, and weird things. Sony designed and the sound system has two speakers. This is the first time I've ever seen this. Um, so it's four speakers on this CRT. It has a little tiny like tweeter speaker and then a larger standard speaker on each side on each side. And it gives the most incredible sound on stereo for a CRT out of it. Cause, and in the way that like the stereos, the way that those tunnels aim the sound and the way that the, uh, speakers are, are pointed. There's like this, um, there's like this, uh, tweak out zone i don't know geek zone i don't know what they called it but it's like you had to stand in this certain zone within a within oh, a, okay. a, a a parameter of the screen and it would just like it, it just it gives you the best sound now if you stood to the right of it it wouldn't sound right mm -hmm. or the left of the zone it doesn't sound as good but if you sit in the zone like in front it'll just blow you away so i was <laughs> i was really intrigued by the sound system the sound system even had little capacitors installed on the tiny speakers like where they came in after the fact and the sound was like probably they were picking up some kind of interference on them and they had to go in and install a bipolar capacitor on every single like a factory budge yes in the factory added huh. yeah, yeah so huh. uh but, but the design of this thing literally makes it a dust like collection zone mm. and eventually that stuff will just fail out because the dust is too much so I went over there, I opened it, I cleaned it, I recapped. That you're working on that right oh, I've now. I've already like, finished that's a it. Pro. And okay, nice. yeah, so I, but I did have to, you know, clean it. It's, it I, I recapped it mm. and I'm going to, the only thing I need to do now is I need to shoot some B-roll of it after it's been finished. Like I've shot everything yeah. before it and I'm trying to do some, I just have been lazy and not shot that section. I got to go up there and just do it. Um, but it's. An incredible looking CRT, an incredible everything. It's just if you have one, you have to open it and get all that dust out. It's good. it's a nightmare. And make sure it's cleaned up. What was your um? Okay, beyond the dust, what was your thoughts on its repairability oh. or its current state, or what were your thoughts on the? Yes, inside? this is actually that's a good question. It's a very high quality uh, chassis. Our circuit boards are high quality inside of it, so they're very serviceable. It's it's very nice to work on them. For like a recap, now they do require you to take a lot of them apart. There's a lot of connections. There's It's a design that was used between a bunch of TVs that Sony had. So there's a lot of board blank areas not populated. I want to say, I want to say that the, uh, sorry, I want to say that the system itself has, there's like a half a dozen boards in it, but there's only... I only had to do 30 caps, I think, in it, and that was to recap the neck bar, neck board, the deflection, and the power. And then, hmm. so it's not as many as uh, a big CRT. But then there's all these other boards in it that are doing all this stuff, like the picture-in-picture, -picture, the tuner, closed caption, yeah, okay. stuff you don't really need to worry about. And those are loaded with caps. They'll be like 
things. It did have. It doesn't have. Did you touch uh, those ones? No, I don't. I don't you know because the they're not. They're they're also not bad. They're very low microfarad. Okay. They I test a lot of them with the, my little meter thing, and they're all fine. And oh yeah, of course they probably don't have many. No, bright, they're not hot. They don't ever get hot. Through, yeah. They don't get a lot of use. Uh, they never get over temperature where it really puts wear on them. The only time they wear out is from time, and so uh, right. then they dry out if they're never used. Otherwise, they can almost self heal over time because they're not getting to a critical temperature they're just it's just re keeping them fresh every time you use them so if you're using it normally it's actually good for them uh but the, the you know it's it's yeah it's a good one i mean if you're if you find one it's people were going crazy yeah, well about it yeah, so yeah. this was funny i got this picture of it after i'd cleaned it up and i was like just trying to take a bunch of pictures of it to put together in a file to send the owner to show him it's been done because he has to come mm. from somewhere far away to get it. And I take these pictures and I was just laughing because I couldn't keep myself, my reflection out of the screen from the picture. <laughs> yeah. And I'm taking one picture and it shows the trash truck come by at the same time as I'm taking the picture. And uh i posted it on twitter and somebody said oh look i'm glad you made it you know you remembered it was trash day and i thought oh that's pretty funny so i posted that picture uh to my youtube community page and i posted oh thankfully i remembered it was trash day and uh posted the picture just so you could see like the reflection of the trash man in it and everybody sort of like said, oh, you lucky son of a bitch. You got another XBR. And like everybody, I didn't even tell anybody. <laughs> no, I didn't get another XBR. It's just a picture. <laughs> they like the whole, co and there's like 50 people in there th thinking that I, I found it in the trash. That Because oh, I was I saying it like it was yeah, trash yeah, okay. day. And I was like, I, that didn't day, even yeah, pop yeah. in my head when I was making it. And I just, so I just <laughs> let it go. So. Uh, so if you're here and you want continue. to know the truth, that's the truth. Otherwise, you won't find out because I'm not going to update that anymore. <laughs> We're 50 minutes into the episode, yeah. we found the real deep, the secret is here. So yeah, let's oh, let's man. tease one last thing because we'll talk about let's sure. talk about. Uh, first off, we'll do probably some guests coming up, but um, mm -hmm. soon we will talk about market stuff because i'm gonna finally probably do another market watch Ooh. uh episode soon i don't know when i mean i've been looking at like sales here let's go over here and share screens real quick and do it, do it, um do it, do it, do it. i'll show you kind of just some stuff so this is sales sold sold listings really recently here in the united states mm -hmm. uh for pvms mm -hmm. right just pulled this up 250 of them um so we could talk more about what's selling what's not selling and it's sure. kind of funny this one look at this one right here you see this one that sold for 119 that that's good that's price. the one i bought <laughs> oh yeah nice nice so yeah i just bought so that's 70 you had to pay i bought this one, 72 yes, shipping on i that. bought this one for it was 199 um and so that one's coming you probably will probably find the other one i bought too in here somewhere but there are a lot of them selling even um it's just a mix of things. So it's definitely something that I feel like talking about, especially considering how I feel like, you know, the United States is coming close to a recession. What does that really mean? Uh, how is that going to impact the collectibles and gaming community? Because it will. Okay. But these monitors, if they're working in good condition, they're still selling. But there's just so much madness and junk in here. What are some of the criteria? So I see recently yeah, you posted top. a couple of like that you bought a couple of PVMs. You made the video about, you know, the coming. So what are, when you were looking down the eBay PVM listings and BVM listings, what makes something stand out to you that you think I want to pick that up? Okay. So for example, this one came up. Uh, I'll just start. I search the listings on eBay daily and um, I'm not signed in, so this one should not pull up and show my address. But if I looked at, let's go see original listing on here. So this one popped up, right? I pull up and I look at, and this one's one of the new listings yesterday. Mm. So I'm looking at this. It's like, okay, 119. This is this is already triggering my uh, yeah value because I'm okay. like, all right, Price? 200 okay. bucks, 200 bucks. It's worth looking sure. more into. So I started looking yeah. at. 
Uh, and I, I see for parts not working. Under that, it says power light comes on, nothing on the screen. I do not have anything to connect it and test it further. So this mm. is a 1341, which, sorry to move all this stuff, you know how eBay is. So if we pull up the picture, this is one of these that doesn't have, you can see the power indicator light down here at the bottom where it's been turned on, but it doesn't have a um, menu, no on-screen menu. It's no, the older one. No on-screen. And so I looked at that, looked at the pictures. Uh, everything looks pretty good, you know, pretty much expected. Right. It's a good mm. price. So I saw that and I was like, okay, 200 bucks. It probably is fine. I'm buying it. I could probably yeah. fix it. The, yeah. Now, the other, That'd be okay for the you, other yeah. thing that's helpful to this is the one I bought before this. I don't know. Let's see if I could find it. It was a 1343. A 1343 PVM, which that was a 1340 we just looked at. And uh, so this is the one I bought right here. Gotcha. So this was the other one I bought because it's super cheap. It's a hundred. It was a hundred shipped, right? Yeah. Okay. That's almost the no brainer. Right. right? But but Ooh. look at it for parts not working, and. This was like the worst listing, as is. It says water damaged, so I don't even know what the heck that means. It has no power cord. Of course, it has no display because they can't test yeah. it. So where's the pictures on it? Let's see if they show the if, – if I could still find any of the photographs. Uh, go original yep. listing. This will show it. Listing. Yep. Look at these. Like it's somebody edited terribly in uh, Microsoft Paint or something, some of these pictures. because yeah. you, you, There's the power cable slit cut oh okay well okay easy enough so i'm Shut looking off. at this it says trash on it i love these kinds saving these right yeah everything's still there there's no emblem so i i just thought that this would be an incredible thing to have a video for right the 50 this was mm. like so my other jvc that i bought that was the ten dollar crt that was fifty dollars i've got a video coming on it called like the fifty dollar crt challenge where um, mm. I paid $50 and got the CRT delivered, unboxed it, yada, yada, yada. So I was like, okay, that's good. This will be the $100 CRT challenge where I get a $100 PVM and I unbox this whenever this shows up, try to fix it, see what's wrong with it, put a new power cable in there. And uh, so I've got that one coming. Then I found this other one. And on top of the combination of those two, someone else sent me a 1342Q that they had packed they had FedEx pack in house, and they did a terrible job of packing it. So it showed up broken yeah. with a bezel busted. Uh, mm -hmm. FedEx packed it themselves, so they paid the insurance. And the monitors here, they just didn't come get it. So I figured, was that the one where the dude didn't insure it for enough? Yeah, like, yeah, he only insured it for three hundred bucks. You talking about that? Yeah. So they just paid him, and it's here. Um, so I figured between the three of them, I have a really good chance of getting two working ones, right? Between those three parts. Yeah. So mm. that'll be the challenge. That'll be the fun part. So it's just like something where those three very much the same, the exact same family of CRTs, those 40 series, all at 13 inches came together, and I was able to get them. Um, and so mm. that's what's going to be coming up, you know, the next couple of weeks on there. Uh but on top of that, I want to kind of go through and see what the market's kind of doing. Um, Cause I don't know. It's, it's just interesting with the way the recessions talks are going in the market, the whole market, it has an impact the on economy, yeah, the whole economy. It has an impact um, on collectibles. And like you and I have talked about this a hundred times. So we're blue in the face. There are people who have businesses that rely on the collectible market that are like legitimate businesses. That is the, sure. then it's unfair to say like, you're not buying things as, as, as an investment because they are, they're moving ma materials. But if you're just somebody who's like a, a collector of collectibles and you don't normally sell your stuff, it's not really right for you to have the mindset that that's some kind of like an investment um, piece. It needs to be, I mean, it's nice that it carries value, but at the same time, um, it's not, you, you know, you can't just go out and walk out and sell it for whatever that value is and think you're going to naively collect a hundred percent of that at the end of the day, because mm. the seller has fees and, and costs and la la la. It's something about the, um, effort 
that it would take to liquidate that asset. Right. Like, yes, okay, it's possible, you could do it, but have you ever sold anything before? Do you know who to sell it to? Do you know how to ship it? Do you know all possible things, but not easy to do. And if we come into a point again where some economic recession happens, there will be a segment of people that will start dropping their things into the marketplace. And those prices are going to start out really high. But again, as that continues, that's what causes prices to kind of go down. So I'm not I'm right, not immediately demand. saying that there's going to be this price dip in something that's as niche and finite as professional video monitors. Because, again, that's super niche. That's like saying you're going to rely on collectible you know, Harley Davidson's to go down in value from, you know, a, a time where they're not made. It's just, it's kind of yeah. silly. But if we think about it from a whole perspective of the entire gaming bubble, collector's bubble in a whole, like these massively printed amounts of video games from our past that have been completely bullshitted up to these exorbitant not realistic levels of value and then people do think they're investing into that that bubble will burst and the fallout will be are you the person who got burned because you bought the snake oil and thought you were like diversifying or investing in something or are you the person who's going to sit there and finally be ready to take advantage of the marketplace and get those collectibles that will come into the marketplace drop in price and be maybe attainable again right before the next big boom happens and these another bubble comes along and and gets the values back up so and i think something doesn't even have to drop like if something's increasing let's say collectibles video games crts it doesn't have to drop it also can just level off that's also big just for prices to calm down to not go crazy to just be very consistent and sometimes actually getting to, oh, I'm getting a really bright light. Sometimes just getting to uh, a drop, like a, an even plateau of price can actually also be a positive indicator because the market is no longer being fueled by speculators and, and people just trying to flip things for a quick buck. Uh, a stable price says things like, yeah, this market is maturing very slowly over time yeah but I, what you were talking about is with po the possibility of crts and so first of all i'm like yeah we they may not uh go down but if they stabilize that's still something really big and then my favorite topic when it comes to the price of crts the one that i'm passionate about because you know you can get 50 you got 70 bucks you got it shipped you've got the the possibility of the entire united states I don't have those possibilities in the small European country of Estonia. We don't have good shipping options. If I want something, I've got to go get it. I really don't have any other choice. If there's a TV in Sweden, I've got to go to Sweden. Uh, we've been talking to our man Martin over there in Denmark about those beautiful Bang & Olufsen TVs that apparently it's it's milk and honey. Apparently it's the, the, the promised land of beautiful Bang & Olufsen TVs still available for 20 bucks, 50 bucks. Uh, I have you know, zero chance of getting that shipped. I mean, yes, not zero, fine. <laughs> but I, I would be. It would be easier for me to just jo get a car, jump on the ferry, drive eight hours from Stockholm down to Copenhagen, get that TV, drive it back. Takes me a day and a half. A day and a, it, it would be much cheaper and, and easier for me to do that. So CRTs are different, and I'm not sure that people truly appreciate how the effects that has on the price when the unit cannot easily be shipped between markets. Your video game can be sent from you to Japan, to Estonia, to all around the world, and therefore there is one market for that Nintendo 64 game. But there is not one single market for our CRTs. If it can't be shipped from America to Estonia, then they are separate markets with separate supply and demand forces on them and so i guess my long-winded point here is uh i first of all screw all the dreamers yeah. in estonia who are trying to put up their price because they see something in america but secondly it will be interesting to see how the markets play out in these in, with products that exist in very distinct markets like crts compared to let's say the nintendo 64 game that exists in one global market
Yeah, that's that should be mentioned that you're right, where you can easily transport goods. So let's think about how this all kind of came to play. This is all basically from the Internet age and the ability for us to go on and track things. I mean, you can look at the idea that collectibles such as retro video games, are they're almost as close to stock market stuff as it is. You go on a website, you buy it, you can sell it, you can do whatever. Uh, and, and that's basically what you're doing when you get a stock account with somebody on the New York Stock Exchange in America. You go and you buy and sell stocks for fees. You, you know, you're trying to lose, make, eh, there's always somebody there buying the stuff. Well, now I've noticed that the things, it might not, on some of these products that are very rare at this point and not remade, and there's, it's the people who really want them will will come into an opportunity where items that normally would not hit the market like you think about these big bvms and it's like if you're somebody who wants to buy a bvm d series uh and you're like i, I don't care i've got the money i've saved up five grand um and i want to buy this bvm and you're just sitting there looking at these crap listings on ebay from somebody who's you know you don't know mm -hmm. what you're getting and even if you claim they claim to say what they're getting, it's still such a big risk for five grand. Well, now you're coming to a point where uh, more stuff will become available on the market. It's just the bubble and the price starts to have decrease quickly is when too much of it hits the market and nobody buys it. And it sits there oh, yep. and the okay. people have to become mm -hmm. desperate and sell it and the prices start to drop. Um, mm. a, a good example of the video game side is I've been beefing up my collection of uh, a couple of Nintendo GameCube titles. And okay. nice. I've been getting good deals that are surprising the heck out of me because I see a game that's been selling and it's listed. Uh, for example, Super Mario Strikers, the soccer game. A complete mm -hmm. one of those, the majority of the listings were $100. But if you just sit there, there's so many listings. There's like hundreds of listings for that game. You just sit there and wait, and every once in a while, somebody will drop one of the what you want for $70. And so that's all I did was just buy one for $70. But that's an example where the market's becoming flooded with certain things, and it doesn't take much to start bringing that price down because all of a sudden the only people buying this stuff is people like me who are looking for a bargain. So all it takes is one person to drop it and sell it for 70 a next seller to go, you know what, this game's not selling at 100 anymore, it's selling at 70 They drop their price to 80 that one sells, bang, 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 and then all of a sudden something de decreases in price by 20% because the only sales that are taking place are at that lower level. Uh, so, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see a lot of this hate taking place and happen. Because up to, the, like, the, now... The, yeah. Thanks to mm. the fueling of the economic things that have happened to this point, it's been more like expanding, right? Everything's been mm. getting more expensive, and it's got to, I mean, right. it's going to do some level of some type of correction. Something has to correct there. And what are the, as you are alluding to, what are the levers of supply and demand that are happening here? So let's take... I don't know, let's take Super Mario Strikers. So what's the demand in the market? We know that gets driven. If there's a lot of supply, ooh, not good. But if there's a lot of demand, hey, then it balances. And what's his name? John Adams tells us everything is fine there. Uh, if there is more supply, as you say, that should push down the price eventually. Um, so if your, your theory is that we're, if we're going into some sort of recession... That will mean people want to liquidate assets. There should be a supply, but also then the demand won't pick up to reflect that because in general, people don't have money. They're looking to liquidate rather than buy. So there's not that easy money around. So that should. Um, okay. But then when we think about su the supply side of things, so let's take Super Mario Strikers. It's not being made anymore. It's not a new thing. How many are out there? Because uh, um, the value of a collectible is also like, what's the, what do they call in the video games? Population report. What's the population? How many are out there right now? And then as a collector, you also have to make a guess as to what do you think, how many are being hoarded away <laughs> and not on the population register. And something like a, a, a definitely with these, vi these video games, we do not know. 
We do not know how many are still available. These Nintendo 64 games, these boxed Super Mario Brothers, these things that are going, we just do not. There are so easily, there could be so many more of these. There could be warehouses. GameCube? Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's, all right, so let's, I love what you're talking about right here. Let's talk about this just a few more minutes here. The So, yeah. The video game and the retro video game collectibles, if you look at that as a market, which it is, it is it is some type of a market because there's being sold, transferred goods are sure. going in and out, people are selling goods. It's just a market. That mm. market has never gone through the kind of cycles. It hasn't had the time to go through a full cycle where mm. it goes through a huge boom phase and then it fizzles out and then... It goes through a boom phase and it fizzles out. Whereas if we look at something that is similar to that, that I've been into for years, comic book, comic books are a great example because there's something that started a generation before that in like the forties. And they've gone through big swoops of times when they would get very popular and then times when they would be practically worthless and people would throw them away and these different dips in the marketplace and then they also go through, since it's been so long, they go through these periods where somehow somebody will find a warehouse filled with $5 million worth of comic books that all of a sudden, how do you, like you say, you're just going to flood the marketplace with them. Or they're all in mint condition from the 60s, and they're like, you know, unbelievably rare, but you just found as many as are out in circulation or something, right? Mm -hmm. So that's... Um, that's all very, very comparable. I think that like, if you compare that now to the video games, we've video games have only been pr printed and popularized in the eighties and nineties. I mean, sure you could say seventies, but that's kind of silly eighties, nineties and early two thousands. So we've gone past that to where it's in this first nostalgia phase and this boom phase, there's going to be a phase again, it's just a natural market swing where it's going to go down. It does. It can't just keep going up all the time. Um, right. I don't know. I sure. mean, everything sure. has to there go are, down. There are these swings. Um, okay. So is this the first time I that's happening the, or is it going to not? Is it just going to flatline? I think the point, the, the point of our discussions here is that we don't have the answer, but we're just trying to point out different forces that can work on the market here. Because, for example, I, I fully believe that there's a whole bunch of... Uh, I've watched enough Storage Wars to know that there's a bunch of stuff. There are a bunch of boxes out there that could. And if you found that, you would not want to tell anybody. You want to just slowly leak that into the market, slowly, slowly to try to liquidate them without saying, hey, I've got the same amount again. But then, okay, then let's compare it to CRTs, where I, I, I have more certainty that there is not the stash of BVMs and PVMs sitting around in someone's, at least, and again, you and I know such larger quantities of BVMs exist in other countries. We, I, you know, you, you've told me a few stories, I know a few stories, but because of the inability to move those into the United States, that doesn't factor on the price that you have right here. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not as confident that there's some large supply of BVMs that are sitting around in a factory. Look, can be the United certainly States, they're still yeah. coming up in the United States. Yeah. I don't think there's this. That's gonna as much as I expect a box of Nintendo 64 games. Yeah. To pop up well somewhere. so then you have that's that's a great example of like macro versus like the micro economics where you're thinking about an entire industry and then you think you're taking one segment and one portion of that bigger market where if you consider like the crt 90 percent of that market is um you know gaming so we put it in the gaming sector where majority of those marketplace transactions are happening is between gaming people mm -hmm and people that find them. So like you say, there are things that limit logistically that, and those limits, they always constrain the market. And so like, like you say, those limits are always there. And so the impact of a large portion of these things coming in and being easily sold off quickly uh, is, not, is not feasible. So like you say that that kind of a that kind of an element doesn't impact 
the small micro market of of the CRT market because it's not an element really ever. Like you say, you're already planned for the logistics nightmare of trying to get around to get the CRT. Like you say, you're either driving or you're hiring a specialty uh, shipping company to move it for you. It's very costly, difficult. That's always the case in the CRT market. It's never not that the case unless you live in the same town that I'm in. Like you're lucky, you know, <laughs> it's like, yeah. so there's that logistical problem is always there. So when you have something like the video games that you can have a large flux of inventory, shoot in the marketplace immediately and be sellable. And I, as a buyer can easily go buy whichever one of these 50 to choose from. That's nearly the same. And I just look for the best price at that point. Cause it's easily shipped to me. Whereas like a CRT, even if you found that 50 of them were listed, you're still like, uh, I don't know which one of these I really want to buy. What's the good condition on them? Where are they? How do I ship them? It's the same same stuff you're always looking at. So, yeah, uh, what drives down the, that kind of a market is the whole market, like the macro market decreasing. So like everything mm -hmm. shrinks a little bit in value. Everything as a whole goes down. So that that would be have more of an impact on a specific okay i wanted to add a new layer to this discussion as well okay that um what is driving so okay supply and demand economy people have got money they haven't got money they're gonna want to sell their goods blah 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 blah. but there's another force that exists here as well and that's just the, the um, well the nostalgia where does nostalgia come from why uh, let's go back to your comic books. Comic books have gone through dips and ups and downs because one, they're a bit older. They're a little bit more of a mature market, but they, their nostalgia is driven by how relevant those characters are today. Absolutely. So when those comic books are, are experiencing a renaissance, one of the reasons, because Marvel, Batman, Spider-Man, so popular right now. Um, what else have we got? Mario, very relevant because if, if there's if there's Mario on a current platform and we're playing Mario in, in here, that also adds to Mario's relevance from the old stuff as well. Now in the CRTs, I don't know. It's the influences. I'm not sure. Maybe it's you. Maybe it's Epos Vox. Maybe it's my life in gaming, doing enough videos, driving that keeping it is is that thing relevant in the current pop culture zeitgeist yeah. and that will also be a, a layer i'm not saying it'll that's you know, that's these are all the factors that go into the stew of pricing exactly that's that's always um like you say the thing that drives the comic books up they don't just sit there and and get relevancy mm -hmm. uh from nothing it's all speculation based on what the movie studios are doing and the tv studios are doing and that will make these prices bump and jump, and these people think they buy low, sell high with a something based off a character in a movie. And it's just it's it's kind of sounds silly, but it's the same. It's exactly what you're talking about. That premise of pop pop culture media driving the price of a nostalgia and the items, um, and then there's already a market there, and so it's like you know there's multiple forces coming into the market to try to make money or to try to collect something or they really like it or they got nostalgia for it. And we all, um, so yeah, like in the same way that the, uh, there's press permission and there's promotions about a movie coming out and people have YouTube channels saying, this is what the movie's like. It's really good or it's really bad. As much as that has an effect on people going to see that movie, that's the same effect we're having as creators on this marketplace. That's the same thing. I mean, no. it's not. It's So if you think yeah. like, oh, well, you know, these guys are driving up the prices. Well, then go tell all the schmucks who do movie reviews that they're driving up the prices of movies or they're causing certain movies to be popular and others to be unpopular. It's the same argument. We're all here uh, giving commentary on something. And as more people come into a marketplace uh that's where growth uh, true growth happens and okay yep. then there's but see then when there's the dip period is when you have a you'll have a a, a a good period of an exodus from the hobby because again we're in a hobby field and a collectible field you will have a lot of those people that 
came on, had their nostalgia fixed, and then all of a sudden they have to get hit with some kind of reality. And sure. they're like, all right, that's the it. Money can it's override over. that. Yeah. I mean, the economy can be bad enough. But I just, doesn't matter how fucking nostalgic you are for Mario. Sorry, you're not going to buy that. Because and then you no sell all your stuff for three quarters what you paid for it um, mm. to somebody. And then that's kind of and then you're and then the biggest problem isn't the fact that you sold the stuff. The thing that's really sad is that you who were passionate about this hobby um, and you know what happens. You just you're not in it anymore. So you're one less person in the market and the people that you talk to that might also like this stuff that doesn't happen anymore. So there's no more extension from your, from your immediate influence into the marketplace. Um, sure. So yeah, it's all it's, and this is all kind of an interesting factor. I think that will play out. I, and if people want to learn more, uh, the reason that I, could talk something about this because I've I've watched so many videos from YouTube channel Reserved Investments. Sean, I love that guy's videos. He's a bit nuts and we love him because he's a bit nuts. He's intense. He he analyzes. He's got this really analytical brain and has an excellent way of breaking down the market, of explaining market forces. There's no hype. He just straight up explains the theory and shows here's a theory. Here's what's happening in the market. So Reserved Investments YouTube channel has given me loads of insights for this. Go Go check it out. Yeah, we should probably reach out and see probably come on yeah i'd love to talk to him oh I'm, i gotta do that he's one of the ones i was a bit worried he was a bit more popular and we had like nobodies and maybe he doesn't but i gotta just write that message oh, all I right i'll write that. to him <laughs> all right well Bro, uh, you gotta yeah, end it up i think i'm a bit hangover my hangover's coming let's do it let's stop gotta... that's good enough that's a good enough little speech there about um yeah. if you guys if you guys yeah if you want to hear more about economics and stuff we'll probably i mean we'll probably do that and put some teaser thumbnail with all these graphs showing like games crashing to the ground. Oh, pricing. that's a good one. That's a good one. And I can, then, I can yeah, work that into that the will thumbnail. Be, be another one of those. And I'm looking forward to now you've done it. I'm going to peer pressure you, Steve. Market watch video, market watch video. We need a new mark. I love the market watch video. So bring out the, bring out the PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right, mate. Thank you everyone for listening. Here we go. Yay, we did an episode. See you next week, everybody. See ya.